Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, the next speaker for the morning session, uh, and that is uh, Mr. Issa Khan, and he is a PhD candidate in uh, Dr. Kaminsky's lab, uh, where he's working on a, a, a dual major in pharmacology and toxicology and environmental uh, and integrative toxicological sciences. Uh, so his research focuses on studying the mechanisms by which the aryl hydrocarbon receptor modulates human hematopo uh, hematopoietic uh, differentiation. Uh, and today his talk is on the characterization of an of an in vitro model uh, of human hematopoiesis to study the role of the aryl hydrocarbon receptor signaling uh, in human hematopoietic differentiation. And with that, I forward to you, Isa. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? All right. Okay. Yep. Uh, thank you, Joe, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to be here to talk on Chris Science Day. Uh, after the wonderful presentations we heard today, it's going to be a difficult act to follow, <laughs> but I'll try my best. Okay. So I'm going to be talking to you about the role of the aryl hydrocarbon receptor in human hematopoietic differentiation and how we have used an in vitro model of human hematopoiesis to characterize the development of different hematopoietic lineages. So for this talk, I'm, have, I'm going to give, uh, break it down into three segments. Initially, I'm going to talk about hematopoietic differentiation in the context of aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And then we'll talk about how we have used single cell transcriptomics to better understand the developmental process of hematopoietic differentiation and then show you data on the effect of aryl hydrocarbon receptor activation on human hematopoietic differentiation. So hematopoiesis, as we know in the adult, um, occurs uh, initially from hematopoietic stem cells. And hematopoietic, and all of the cells of the hematopoietic uh, system arise from the hematopoietic stem cells, which can then differentiate into multipotent progenitors and which through lineage restriction, uh, from different lineage restricted populations. And these ultimately differentiate further on to give all the mature lineages of the hematopoietic system as we know it. So most in vitro studies that are in place currently utilize different culture conditions and different cytokines and growth factors to facilitate growth of different hematopoietic uh, stem cells. And this is uh, for good reason because different cell types rely on different culture conditions for their uh, growth. However, today I'm going to be talking about um, an, in uh, an in vitro model later on that can be used to follow the development of multiple cell types in one system. So how does uh, aryl hydrocarbon receptor play a role in hematopoiesis and what is this receptor? Aryl hydrocarbon receptor or AHR is a ligand activated transcription factor that in the absence of ligand binding is normally sequestered in the cytoplasm. So once it, a ligand bounds to the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, it detaches from the in chaperon proteins and translocates to the nucleus where it can bind to the aryl hydrocarbon nuclear translocator to form a heterodimer. And this heterodimer can then bind to cognate motifs on the DNA called aryl hydrocarbon response elements to regulate gene expression of a wide variety of genes. And this receptor plays important physiological roles in different systems. However, originally it was identified as a mediator of toxicology, uh, toxicological uh, of immuno of different toxicants. So some of the toxicants that are can bind to a hydrocarbon receptor include uh, diverse compounds such as halogenated and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, dioxins and dioxin-like compounds, and so on. However, there are also an equal number of diverse endogenous compounds as well. And these endogenous compounds can include tryptophan derivatives, such as, for example, one of the most well-studied ones uh, is FIGSI, as well as arachidonic acid metabolites and so on. So these are the most widely studied endogenous ligands of AHR. And sources of these endogenous ligands can be from various sources, but the predominant ones include diet. So for example, cruciferous vegetables, such as broccoli, kale, are a good source of endogenous ligands of HR, as well as microbiota in the gut, for example, is rich in endogenous uh, ligands for HR. And HR plays an important role in the differentiation 
landscape of different physiological cell types. And, but among them, immune cells are particularly susceptible. And HR is the effect of HR activation on differentiation is very interesting as it is often highly context specific. And depending on the cell type, as well as the ligand, it can play different roles. So one of the, for example, when uh, exogenous ligands, uh, which are immuno, often immunotoxicants, uh, bind to the AHR, this can cause diverse effects such as immunosuppression, which involve, for example, thymic involution, as seen in the rodents, where there is a reduction in the number of thymocytes. And it can also lead, affect visual uh, maturation and can lead to impaired humoral responses and antibody-mediated activities. Depending on the ligand, um, AHR can also be involved in different regulatory roles. For example, it can mediate the differentiation of T cells into either uh, helper T cells or 17 cells or regulatory T cells. But what about the source of the immune cells themselves, the CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells from which all these hematopoietic cells arise? And al hydrocarbon receptor can be important, play an important role there as well. So in 2011, Boitano and colleagues showed that by antagonizing the al hydrocarbon receptor, we get increased expression of CD34 on hematopoietic stem cells and manifold proliferation of CD34 positive stem cells. So this suggested that AHR plays an important role in the, uh, progress, in the differentiation of the CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells. And when we talk about HR, we cannot but also mention TCDD, which is an important exogenous ligand for the HR. So TCDD is a member of the dioxin family, and it's a persistent environmental contaminant, and is produced as a byproduct of different industri industrial manufacturing processes, as well as incomplete combustion of at high temperature. It is highly lipophilic, has a very long half-life, and a high affinity for the receptor and can exert different uh, toxic, uh, uh, toxicant activities on different physiological cells of the, uh, of the human body. So such as reproductive toxicity, hepatotoxicity, and so on. So we are going to be focusing only on the immunotoxicity purposes here. And uh, a lot of literature, literature exists, which show that uh, TCDD can impair the differentiation of different mature cell types. So for example, the maturation of B cells into antibody producing cells can be uh, impaired by TCDD. However, relatively there are a few studies which look at the developmental profile of uh, immune cells uh, uh, using TCDD. So uh, in a study in our lab previously by Dr. Lee, he has explored the effect of TCDD on B cell development as they develop from hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. And so he looked at the development over a 28-day period. So this is a spade diagram, which, which summarizes his findings. So this diagram is essentially a 2D uh, plot showing uh, different cell populations that are grouped together based on the expression of markers that have been measured with flow cytometry. So early on, we have, CD, we have the hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. And we can follow the, their development over time by looking at the marker CD79 alpha, which is a marker for early B cells. And if we look at this spade diagram, we can see that uh, on day zero, hematopoietic stem cells express very little CD79 alpha. And as they develop over time, by day 21 and day 28, we have a significant number of early B cells and pro B cells. So how is this profile affected by TCDD? With increasing concentrations of TCDD, we find that this uh, formation of RDB cells and pro-B cells is uh, impaired and at an, in a concentration-dependent manner. And at a very low concentration of TCDD, such as one, uh, one nanomolar of TCDD, we see complete abrogation of B cell development. But what are the mechanisms by which this actually occurs? So, EBF1 or early B cell factor one and paired box five, PAX5 are two important transcription factors or genes that are important for B cell lineage specification and commitment. And Dr. Lee had shown that the expression of these two genes were suppressed by TCDD treatment. 
However, there could be upstream regulators of these uh, two genes, which could be affected as well, but that was not investigated. And so even in the literature, there is not a thorough understanding or complex uh, or a comprehensive understanding of all the genes and pathways that might be perturbed as the as B cells develop from hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. And so we wanted to investigate how hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells differentiate over time and what are the genes and pathways that are uh, affected by, for example, HR activation. So with single cell transcriptomics uh, coming into play, we realized that now we have a tool to study stage-specific expression of genes that could be perturbed by TCD treatment. So single cell transcriptomics allow us to capture single cells and with a barcoding system where individual cells can be barcoded and the mRNA in a particular cell can be identified and linked to that particular cell, we realized we could uh, identify stage-specific perturbation of genes by HR activation. So we carried out a single cell transcriptomic study and with the objective to identify the effect of HR activation on hematopoietic progenitor differentiation in humans. And before I go further, it's important to talk about the model system we have in place. So we have an in vitro culture system where we start off with human cord blood derived C34 positive hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, which we seed in a 96 well plate on the start of the experiment. And we had use RPMI, with, which has uh, a minimal number of uh, tryptophan derivatives. And we add cytokines such as IL-6 and the growth factors FLT3 ligand and stem cell factor for the growth and proliferation of these cells. We also add uh, our treatment, which can be the control or the HR agonist in for this particular study. And then on day seven, we replace half of the media with fresh media, but this time we replace IL-6 with IL-7, which is a lymphoid promoting cell promoting cytokine and add FLT3 ligand and stem cell factor to replenish uh, the previous uh, growth factors. And then on day 14 and 21, we add fresh media again to replace half the media, but this time we do not add any more cytokines or growth factors. And if you notice, we add the cytokines or growth factors at a pretty low concentration of about 20 to 25 nanogram per ml. How, so we, for this study that I'm going to show you, I have added uh, the treatments on day zero. However, this can be added at any time point actually. And this model can actually be an important uh, time of addition as a system as well. So let's get into the study itself. So for single cell uh, transcriptomic study, we treated the cells on day zero with either one nanomolar of TCD, uh, which uh, we had seen previously can lead to important, important perturbations. And as a control, we use 0.02% DMSO. And then we collected the cells on day zero and every cell uh, every seven days from the vehicle and TCD treated groups. So, and then these cells were then uh, uh, with single cell with 10x chromium profiling from uh, sing and single cell uh, mRNA sequencing, we generated different reads from individual populations. And this was then through a uh, process to a series of bioinformatics analysis tools which ultimately gave us an expression profile of single cell gene by cell by gene expression metrics. For our data set, we had about 28,000 cells and about 14,000 genes. So this was a large data set. To make sense of this large data set, we reduced uh, this, uh, yeah, added, we performed dimensional reductionality technique on this uh, metrics so that we can visualize the cells on a two dimensional plot. So the, Plot here is uh, typical of a, a UMAP plot, so where the cells are arranged uh, relative to each other based on gene expression. And based on proximity of gene expression, the cells were then clustered into different cell clusters. And then I annotated these cells based upon uh, the expression of different uh, lineage markers from literature. And then this was followed by post downstream applications, such as we could, I performed differential expression analysis between the different clusters, uh, infer transcription factor activity for based on gene expression, did gene set enrichment analysis using different pathways, and also uh, carried out flow cytometric confirmation, for example. So I'm going to go into detail about how I carried this out. Uh, 
So we found that different clusters express different uh, lineage marker genes. So for example, the more, uh, we found uh, in our data set, so this is a composite of all the cells collected over a 28 day period from both vehicle and TCD treated groups. So in this uh, UMAP, uh, data, we find that the cells at the bottom, for example, express genes that are associated with monocytes and macrophages. And we can see the cells at this top end of the UMAP plot express a lot of uh, early B cell marker genes. And so we could identify that cl any cluster that are associated with uh, in this region is associated with B cells, for example. So in this manner, we clustered the, our data, our uh, data set and uh, the different uh, cell populations and based upon the literature in a semi-supervised manner. So in order to figure out how the cells develop naturally over time, I selected from this uh, vehicle and TCD treated uh, total composite cells, only the vehicle associated uh, cells so that we could follow the natural progression of cells in the absence of any treatment in our model. So you can see we have a hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. We also have formation of multipotent progenitors of different types. So, which have labeled as MPP, MPP2, and MPP3. We'll have virtually hematopoietic cells of almost all of the lineages. So we have a lymphoid uh, population as well as an early B cell cluster. We have a megakaryocyte erythrocyte progenitor cluster and have the promyelocyte and neutrophil populations have there are pro-monocyte populations as well, as well as early monocytes, late monocytes, and a macrophage population. We also have uh, small amounts of uh, PDCs and dendritic cell populations as well. So the next question was, this is a composite of all the cell populations. So how do they develop over time? So if we break it down in, over time, we can see that the earliest populations are the, obviously the multipotent progenitor populations, we also see a formation of an early monocyte cluster. And over time, on day 14, we see the emergence of a lymphoid population and as well as the neutrophil cluster. By day 14, a lot of the progenitor populations decline to give rise to the more mature cell types. And by day 28, this effect is actually accentuated even further. So one thing we noticed with uh, these clusters was that they are often differed in the expression of cell cycle genes. And so we carried out a cell cycle scoring of the different clusters. So we, I have plotted the cells here, uh, the percent of cells in each of the cell cycle phases. So one thing we noticed was that the progenitor clusters, so for example, the MPP2 pro-monocytes clusters, which give rise to the monocytes, they were higher in the scoring for the, uh, for the S and G2M phases and low in the G1 uh, for the G1 phase. Whereas the more lineage committed populations were associated with a, a, gre a greater percentage of cells in the G1 phase and very few in the S and G2M phase. Now this could have different implications, but one thing could be is that these uh, earlier progenitor populations are going through the cell cycle faster compared to the more lineage restricted populations which are much more slow moving as they pass through the cell cycle. Now, I had shown you previously about the temporal uh, breakdown of the different clusters. However, that doesn't necessarily tell us about the ontogeny of development uh, because uh, even though they're forming at the same time, we might not necessarily know from which cluster the other clusters might actually be developing. And so we carried out a zero time analysis. So what this basically is, zero time is a measure of gene expression or developmental expression over time. So we did an independent analysis where we used these clusters that we had and used a trajectory inference algorithm to with hematopoietic stem cell expressing genes being the earliest uh, source of earliest uh, starting point and carried out a trajectory of those cells over, <coughs> over the, different uh, across the different cluster populations and based upon their trajectory uh, where the cells lay in the trajectory the cells were associated with a zero time score or the developmental score we then projected this developmental score back onto the original clusters and when you found what you found was that what well, gave us an, an understanding or perhaps the ontogeny of development so for example, you'll notice that the hematopoietic stem cells naturally have a pseudo-time, low pseudo-time score, 
indicating that they are the beginning of the development. And the megakaryocyte erythroid and the MPP cluster predominantly have cells of with a very, with a lower zero time score as well. And cells of the more lineage restricted populations and the terminal populations have a higher pseudo time score. So further confirming that the ontogeny of development that these MPPs and megakaryocyte erythroid uh, progenitors are the earlier progenitor populations from the hematopoietic stem cells and then progressively give rise to the different clusters as we had also uh, kind of surmised from the way the clusters were arranged in the UMAP plot before. So this gives us more confidence in how the cells are clustered in the UMAP space as well. So you'll notice that the pro-monocyte and pro-monocyte populations have a higher, have a similar pseudo time score, which also suggests that they might have a similar ontogeny of development as well. So one thing with single cell transcriptomics is that it allows us to explore the heterogeneity between of different populations, which are maybe similar, but perhaps not so similar. And with the bioinformatics tools that are associated with this with single cell transcriptomics analysis, we could explore the heterogeneity between different populations. So one thing we noticed was that the emergence of an early monocyte cluster and late monocyte cluster. And even though they expressed a lot of monocyte related genes, we wanted to see how they were actually different uh, and what was driving the differences. So we carried out, when you looked at the differential expression analysis uh, between early monocytes and late monocytes, we saw several genes uh, that uh, could explain how they are different. So this is a, a plot of the top differentially expressed genes that are significant. And with each dot representing the percentage of cells that express a particular gene. And the uh, color represents the average scale expression across these columns of the of gene expression. So we noticed that the late monocyte population had uh, genes such as uh, CAMP, uh, TIC-SNP or thyroidoxin interacting protein, FPP1, which are associated with vitamin D and glucose metabolism, for example. And whereas the earlier monocytes had, a lot, had genes such as CXCL8, sorry, which encodes for IL8, as well as F13A1, for example, which are associated with inflammatory conditions. To get a better understanding, we carried out an overrepresentation analysis of all the differentially expressed genes between the late monocyte and the early monocyte populations. And this against a hallmark set of databases, pathways. And this gives us better understanding of what are the main pathways that are different between the early monocytes and late monocytes. So for example, we noticed that late monocytes were downregulated in pathways associated with NF-kappa B signaling, interferon gamma response, and inflammatory response. And, but were upregulated in processes such as oxidative phosphorylation, um, and mixed, uh, mixed signaling and mTORC1 signaling, which are often associated with proliferation, for example. <clears throat> so what about the heterogeneity within, a within those clusters, which, are, which we can observe at all time points, but might actually be different across time? So we wanted to explore that kind of heterogeneity as well with single cell transcriptomics. So we selected our cells from the dendritic cells from the entire group of cells, and then reanalyzed them and clustered them at a low resolution. So, and we saw the emergence of two major clusters. So this red cluster appeared mainly on day seven and 14, whereas the green cluster of cells mainly appeared on day 21 and 28. And we wanted to again explore how these cells that emerge later are different from the ones that emerged earlier. Again, we carried out differential expression analysis and looked at how the top genes that were differentially expressed between across time in this dendritic cell population. We saw, for example, that the cells, dendritic cells that were appearing later on had a more monocytic signature, such as it expressed higher levels of CD14 compared to cells that were at the beginning, as well as other uh, pro-monocyte associated genes such as CBPB and galalectin 2 Whereas the earlier dendritic cell populations expressed a more of uh, uh, cell cycle associated genes, as well as uh, genes that are more perhaps indicative of the classical dendritic cell phenotype. So for example, MRC1, which encodes CD206, uh, was higher in the earlier population cluster compared to the ones that came later. We also thought of doing a supervised analysis on these based upon these findings. So we've recent literature suggests that dendritic cells can are, can be of several subtypes, and the two of the major clusters, cell types are CD1C 
a type A and CD1C type B, with CD1C being a common marker for classical dendritic cell type 2. So we, from the literature, we curated a set of genes that are associated with different cell types of, of with these different cell types and calculated a module of genes and that and got an average score of module score for the average expression of these uh, cell associated genes. When we plotted the module score of these different cell types over time, we found that the module score of CD1C type A was constant, is constantly increasing till day 21 when there was a switch like behavior and, it, and there was a decrease uh, by day 28. And at the same time, we saw that an, an increase in CD1C type B uh, score. Uh, so this is so CD1C type B cells are associated with a monocyte signature, and this again was consistent with what we had seen in an unsupervised fashion from our differential expression analysis, where we see CD14 positive cells expressing a, 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 at day 28 in the dendritic cell cluster. So how does TCDD affect this development? If we look at uh, the developmental progression of cell hematopoietic progenitors side from the vehicle and TCDD group side by side, uh, immediately we notice on day seven, for example, that there is a reduction in the megakaryocyte erythroid progenitor clusters uh, population in the TCDD group compared to that of the vehicle. Also on day seven, we have the emergence of lymphoid populations uh, in the vehicle group, but absence of that in the TCD group as, we had pre as was previously known. On day 21, we also notice uh, formation of RDB cells, but again, obviously, we see absence of these cells in the TCDD treatment group. One thing we also noticed was that in the TCDD group, there is still cells that clustered in the early monocytes and the pro-monocyte groups, whereas such a cluster was missing in the vehicle group. So one possible reason could be that TCDD might perhaps impede the progression of the earlier monocytes to a later monocyte uh, phase. And TCDD has been known to cause uh, impede uh, differentiation of many cell types. So I wouldn't be really surprised if that was the case. Uh, also, and so we see similar changes as well uh, in, uh, by day 28 with lack of B cells in the TCD group compared to the vehicle. If we look at the percentage of cells uh, in each cluster over across the different treatments and over time, we can find other similarities and differences as well. So here the vehicle is in yellow and the TCD group is in uh, purple. So when you look at the multipotent progenitor populations, we find virtually very similar proportions between vehicle and TCDD groups. However, early on, uh, we, saw, we see an increase in the pro-monocyte and earlier monocyte populations in the TCDD group. And this trend actually continues on day 14 as well. By day 21, we see an increase in the lead monocyte uh, populations in the TCDD group compared to the vehicle. And by day 28, we see similar trends with the lead monocyte population, as well as an almost two-fold increase in the monocyte macrophage uh, population in the TCD group compared to that of the vehicle. So we decided to confirm our results of single cell transcriptomics with flow cytometry. And flow cytometry um, allows us to identify different cells, mark, allows us to identify different cells on the basis of different markers associated with each of these lineages. This is a two-dimensional plot from day 21, which shows uh, the, two, the different cell types that we investigated with flow cytometry. So that this Disney plot is again a lower dimensional representation of all of the cell markers that are associated with different cell types and so that the cells can be visualized. Uh, so the CD34 cells, which express the progenitors are present predominantly in this cluster, CD14 cells representing the monocytes and CD66B represents the neutrophils and CD1C marker was used to identify the type 2 dendritic cell cluster. When you looked at uh, vehicle and TCDD, so for initially we downsampled uh, cells from both groups to an equal number of cells. And when you compared vehicle and TCDD cell types, we saw that clearly that there was an increase in the monocyte populations and neutrophil populations in the TCDD group compared to that of the vehicle, as well as an absence of these lymphoid populations in the TCDD group. And if, if we look at the dendritic cell populations, however, there is virtually very little difference between vehicle and TCD groups, obvious from the TSNI plots. So if we break it down even further and look at 
the, all of the populations that we actually investigated with flow cytometry, we find other differences as well. So we saw that with TCDD treatment, so TCD again being in purple and vehicle being in yellow, we see an decrease in the CD34 positive cells with TCD treatment, uh, an increase in the CD14 positive cells with TCD treatment, as well as an increase in the granulocytes, but at the expense of the lymphoid populations marked by CD10 and the early B cells marked by CD19. The dendritic cells were virtually similar between <laughs> vehicle and TCD groups. We also find the emergent formation of other cell types, yes, at a lower concentration, but they do exist. So for example, the megakaryocyte progenitors can be identified by CD41 expression, and we find a reduction in their population with TCD treatment. However, we also find this happening at the expense of the a thread population, and this is actually quite well known where um, often the uh, decrease in megakaryocyte cell population leads to an increase in the erythroid cell population. We also notice a bona fide population of CD56 positive cells, which are the NK cells, and those were decreasing also with TCDD. So I haven't shown you here um, data on T cells. And so even though we do not have T cells in our system, we identified uh, pro T cells developing in our system, marked by the expression of CD7. Uh, and we also saw that those were decreasing with TCD treatment as well. So this was representative of one single experiment. And when we looked at the composite of three experiments over time, we also see similar trends in the major populations. So CD14 <laughs> cells and CD66 V positive cells increasing with TCD treatment at the expense of lymphoid populations. The dendritic cell populations have remained virtually similar between vehicle and TCDD. Now, going back to single cell transcriptomics, we had previously looked at heterogeneity within the dendritic cell population and decided if TCDD can also affect these heterogeneous populations as well. And we found that this was actually the case for the dendritic cell population. So we remember we had two types, two major types of dendritic cell populations, such as CD1, C type A, and type B. And when you looked at the module score, we found that TCDD here in red. Uh, we found that the CD1C type A associated gene expression in the dendritic cells was lower in the TCDD treated group compared to the vehicle across the entire study time. Whereas the CD1C type B score, which is associated with a monocyte signature, was higher in the TCDD treated group compared to that of the vehicle. So again, this suggests that TCD perhaps drives the cells towards a more monocyte-like signature, even within the dendritic cell population. Um, so now going back to what we initially started on and our quest to find uh, what genes or pathways might actually explain that uh, that might actually be perturbed by TCD treatment that could explain the, for the absence of lymphoid progenitors and B cells. And so if you remember the lymphoid cluster was adjacent to the multipotent progenitor cluster and emerged from it. And so we decided to probe the multipotent progenitor cluster and see how TCDD affect the, the gene expression in, within this particular cluster. So here again are the top differentially expressed genes in the multipotent progenitor cluster on day 14. And among the genes that were differentially expressed, we do again see an increase in inflammatory <laughs> genes such as IL-8 in the TCDD treated group. But we also notice a decrease in several lymphoid and B-cell associated genes such as MEF2C, BCD11A, TCF4 as well. And I was particularly interested in the expression in the BCL11A gene because BCL11A is known to be an upstream regulator of early B-cell factor one, which is important for B-cell lineage specification and commitment. And we decided to see if this was true also with at the protein level as well. So I measured BCL11A exp expression within our cell populations and the percentage of BCL11A positive cells in the 12 population our, there was a trend with, with, of decrease with TCDD in, compared to that of the vehicle. Although this is very preliminary data, it, it did suggest a slight decrease on day 14 and 21. However, uh, when you looked further into the lymphoid population, the CD10 positive, CD19 negative populations, we found that the difference was much more pronounced. And there was a decrease in the percentage of bcd 11 positive cells in the TCD treated group compared to that of the vehicle. So in conclusion, I would say that the model we have in place is a not so complex model that is stromal cell free 
and can but and can also help support the formation of different uh, hematopoietic cell types. And so this could be useful from an immunotoxicology perspective because we could apply different immunotoxicants and see the effect of these to toxicants on hematopoietic, different hematopoietic lineages at the same time within a single system. And as we have shown with the case with TCDD, for example. Also, we saw showed that HR activation by TCDD leads to an increase in the monocyte and granulocyte populations at the expense of the lymphoid populations. Also with single cell transcriptomics, we could focus on specific cell populations and identify which genes are, might be perturbed by any kind of treatment, such as that we saw with TCD treatment. And we could identify potential genes that might explain uh, the, per the perturbation of hematopoiesis that we have observed with TCDD. So at this point, I'd like to acknowledge uh, people for my work. So I'd like to thank Dr. Norbert Kaminsky, my advisor, for his support, Dr. Pierre Karmas for help with single cell transcriptomics analysis, uh, Bob Crawford for help with flow cytometry, and Tony Back for help with single cell transcriptomics, as well as Dr. Blevins and Jingfeng Li for their uh, support and input with analysis, as well as my committee members and current and past lab members. Also like to thank my the funding agency, MSC Superfund Center, for allowing us to be able to carry out this work. I'm also thankful to the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology, my home department, as well as the Institute for Integrative Toxicology. And thank you, and I'll take any questions. Yes. Question regarding your, your changes in the MPPs or RB mm -hmm. molecular cells, given the effects of, say, SR1, which enhances those cells. Uh, given the effect of SR1? Stem regenerating. Oh, okay. Uh, SR1. Yeah. Another AHR agonist. Agon antagonist. Uh, so, uh, antagonist, yes. Does that make sense in your mind about seeing the, the sort of uh, opposing effects on, on that subset? Uh, well, stem regen is an antagonist, and so TCDD is an agonist. So I'm not actually surprised at the effects we're seeing. I would say that TCDD is, leads to rapid differentiation of the CD34 positive cells, which is the opposite of what we see with stem regen, which is an antagonist. So I'd say. But have you also done it together to see whether they can? No, we haven't actually explored that. Or, or, or what's the dose response in terms of seeing those effects out there? Well, uh, previous studies in our lab had looked at B cells and had looked at concentration um, responses with TCDD. So we found that with one animal of TCDD, we see a, a complete abrogation of B cell development and it's still very low and relevant physiologically. And so we decided to uh, go on with this particular concentration. So we didn't do a concentration response for all of the cell populations. Yes. I think my question is kind of a follow-up from that, but it comes from more of a chemistry point of view. Okay. This, this is amazing data, and, mm -hmm. and your professor tells me that you're going to shoot for a very high-impact journal, and I highly encourage you to do so. This is a lot of work. Um, Thank you. But it's just one chemical. It's one particular dioxin. So... <laughs> I don't think that research labs can afford to do single cell RNA for a series of different chemicals. So can you explain what, what is your expert opinion about how can this data, maybe some part of this data be pulled out and then you can compare other chlorinated chemicals against it or other dioxin materials against it? Was there some unique finding here and maybe you came to it at the very end that could then be a biomarker that could be used in your cells and not go through the single cell RNA expense. Does that make sense to yeah, you? Yes, uh, thank you. That's a very good question. So what I can see, for example, is that, um, so some of the genes that we find are being differentially expressed in different populations. So that can give us a clue as to which genes to, so in the, even in the absence of treatment, how the genes are uh, changing and so, with TCDD, we also saw particular genes being changed. And so, 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 so we could do qPCR with other compounds. Okay. 
if they're congeners of the TCDD family, for example. As for other types of compounds, uh, again, I think the single cell transcriptomics data uh, for the model development in absence of any treatment can also provide clues as well based on that. And if we are to use markers for different populations, so for example, we can identify markers that are associated with different clusters. And so, for example, one thing could be we could select out, sort out cells based on those markers and then do further downstream applications based on those sorted cells. We could do QPCR again on those sorted cells, for example, with different treatments. I like, I like that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's a question online here. Um, and the question is, how can one distinguish that the early versus late cell types, uh, for example, monocytes or dendritic cells are two different cell populations with the same cells, but undergoing different stages of development in time and thus different uh, transcript expression. Yeah, that's actually true. So we cannot conclusively say that these are potentially different cell types. They could be just cell states rather uh, that are transitioning to the system. But then again, it's too useful to know um, the different stages of development. So we could identify stage specific effects of a perturbing agent on the development and could interpret the results that we are seeing. Yes, the question. Okay, I have two questions. Okay. Um, so, so first, do you, do you think in your model, so you show increase in, sorry. Hi, so you show an increase in myopo myopoiesis and a decrease mm -hmm. in B uh, lymphopoiesis. Right. Do you think uh, you can tell it on your model that TCDD is affecting myeloid cells or this is the increase in myeloid cells is just because you are depleting B cells? Do you think that's what's happening? Because you saw more decrease in signaling that leads to B cell development, but myeloid you saw mainly uh, on percentages. Is that correct? Uh, we looked at percentages of both cell types actually. Right, but percentages doesn't tell us if it's affecting a cell or it's just a matter of okay. decreasing B cells. So that's why you see more myeloid. So do you think in your model, you can tell uh, um, definitively that TCDD is affecting both B cell and increasing myeloid or okay. it's only the B cell? So depleted? I have shown you the percentage cell populations, but we have also calculated the total cell number as well. And we have seen that increase in the monocyte population as well. And the monocyte population, and for example, with TCDD, the changes that we see in the percentages are very reflective of the total cell populations changes that we also see. Great. Yeah, I would still consider because in vivo, if you deplete the B lymphopoiesis, myelopoiesis will take over. Right. Uh, just normally, it's not that it's affecting anything on their pathway. It's mm -hmm. just that now they are uh, the the progenitors are going direction. The MPPs and are taking efforts for myeloid because they are blocked for the lymphoid. So I'll take that into consideration because right. it might be um, your model is a nice one to see the B cell depletion. And the next question, if I can, if I have time quickly, I think it was Norb that shows that um, going back to the fetal versus adult, the green and red cells that I discussed, yeah. uh, I think the the fetal derived B cells have different expression of AHR and they might respond to the environment differently, right? So the B1 cells are the fetal derived and the B2 cells are the adult derived. Your model now could be representing the red type, the, the adult type of B cell development. But in the mouse data, AHR seems to be more relevant to the fetal type. Do you have any speculation on how you can uh, um, make any leap here into the mouse work on the different type of B cells that respond differently or have different AHR receptors versus your model? Well, if we go towards the mouse, then we probably might need to change some of the cytokines as well. But uh, I'm not absolutely sure if we would need to change. But, you know, it, the mouse cells and B cell and uh, and human hematopoietic cells are different. And so they might require slightly different culture conditions. Although I could say that is very interesting. I mean, I think we'll have to try it out to see how the developmental progression will occur there. Because we are also, for example, adding IL-7 uh, on day seven and IL-7 is important for lymphoid development even in the mouse B cells, for mouse B cells as well, so. All right, I think we're gonna have to move to the next uh, session because we're a little bit behind schedule. So thank you again, Dr. or Mr. Khan, almost to be doctor. <laughs>